uh, today. As, as, well, as far as my Estonian goes, um, I hope that you said nice things about me. Um, well, I'm very happy to be here. Um, I don't know if she said it, but I, yes, I have an Estonian wife. So that's why I happen to be in this part of the world, but I'm originally from Barcelona. And I lived a bit everywhere. I lived seven years in Brussels. I've been working as a lobbyist, and uh, I've been setting up uh, Zero Waste Zero already since uh, five, six years. And what I try to do today is uh, give you kind of an overview of what Zero Waste is about, and also um, Ah, no, 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 I will count okay. and, I'll, I'll, and if you have questions, feel free to interrupt me. Ask, um, let's try to make it interactive, because otherwise it, it can be uh, a bit less fun. All right? So um, um, let's start. First of all, when we talk about waste, uh, I don't know how many of you have seen these kind of movies, but uh, uh, people think, well, it's something boring that I don't care, etc. But People make movies about it, and people seem to be crazy about it. In Garbage Dreams, in the upper right side, uh, upper left side, it was about uh, Egyptian young people, basically, who are making a living out of out of garbage and they turn it into resources. And we collaborated with this movie. It was really amazing. They were recycling around 80 percent of the garbage in in Cairo. In the, in Super Trash, it was it was a movie where uh, basically uh, a French guy decided to go to live in a landfill to really check what are we throwing away, and it was amazing. He was surfing, literally surfing, with a surfboard that he found there inside the trash, and he was eating what he was finding in the landfill, which was perfectly edible. I mean, really gross, but people <laughs> would go to see these things, right? So then you have Wasteland, which is a movie in Brazil, and uh, that's basically about waste pickers living in a landfill who um, use trash to make art. And it's true that it's something that lots of people uh, use basically um, trash as a prime uh, material to make art with. In Slumdog Millionaire, that's a bit more well known, you know, it's uh, someone who starts as a waste picker and finds its luck, but you see it's a beginning of a story, waste is, can be a good beginning. And Gomorra, it's probably the, the saddest one, but it's, it's, it's very real. Waste, uh, above all, is, is, is also about money. And um, it's not surprising that there's so much corruption associated to waste and mafia involved. Because you have to know that any normal municipality, the first or second or third budget line is going to be waste management. So of course, where there is money, there is economic interest, and therefore there's going to be political interest. So it's the beginning, but it's also the end. If we fix the waste problem, we can fix political problems, we can fix uh, corruption problems, and uh, also social problems. Um, and besides that, of course, uh, waste is a global challenge. Um, you've seen uh, probably pictures about uh, how our oceans are polluted. I mean, uh, our oceans and rivers are literally full of plastic. And the worst thing is the plastic that we don't see. I mean, it's, it's really, it's breaking into pieces, it's getting into the food chain, it's in the fish that we are eating, it's in the water we're drinking. So, I mean, we are getting to a, really a difficult situation from an ecological but also economic perspective. And from a social perspective, it's, it's also an issue. I mean, there's millions and millions of people around the world who make a living out of separating waste, recycling it, turning it into a resource, or just like uh, polluting the, the ground and everything. But above all, I think it's, it's a moral issue because uh, human beings are supposed to be intelligent people. We are supposed to have the most intelligent generation of, uh, of human beings in this planet. And this is the generation that has generated more waste than all the other generations together. And here there's something that's challenging. I mean, why are we doing this to ourselves? I mean, why the most intelligent generation in this planet is the one that is destroying the planet is going to threaten not our lives, but the f lives of our future of our, and our children. Um, and that's, I think it's a moral issue, it's a philosophical issue. I mean, why are we doing this to our children? And, um, well, I don't have the answer. But uh, what I'll try to explain is that zero waste is a way to address this moral issue. Because it's not, about, uh, it's not a technical fix. 
when we're putting toxics into the products, when we are not recycling, when we are not separating, etc. What we are doing is actually really threatening the lives of our children. Animals don't do that. Animals, they really protect their children above anything else. Why human beings are endangering uh, their future generations? So that's, that's a question that is really worth asking. So, to keep it short, uh, there's the waste side story and there's the, the, the waste side story. Um, it's difficult to start from, a, from the same level of what do we understand by waste. But if I ask you, um, what is waste for you? Can you give me a definition? Anyone? Something useless. It's left. Something is left. That's it. What's left? There's something which can't be recycled anymore. Something cannot be recycled. Mm -hmm. Used resources. Used resources. Mm -hmm. Or unused resources. <laughs> or unused resources. That's true. Excess resources. Excess resources. Mixed resources. That's also true. So you see, I mean, there's lots of possible definitions. I mean, waste is all the things you've said and, and even more. Um, how the European legislation defines waste is uh, that thing that the, the owner of that thing basically intends to discard or get rid of, basically. What you really, what you don't want anymore, what you basically uh, put outside the door, etc., that is waste. Whereas it's metal that can be easily recycled, or whereas a dirty uh, nappy that cannot be recycled. All that is considered to be waste. Um, and of course, that's just a legal uh, interpretation. But we have to understand that a waste is, as I said, is an economical, but it's a, pol a political thing. Um, are there economies in the room? No economists? One? Half? We don't have a single economist. Okay. Because I think then I, I, will, I will spare you the economic explanation. But you have to understand that waste is something that has been engineered. We, our ancestors, were not uh, producing waste. I mean, if you look at Estonians 200 years ago, all the waste that was being generated was basically organic waste that was probably being fed to the animals or composted and being brought back to the soils. Or it was wood, stones things that could be used as construction material, etc. So that, that didn't exist then. Uh, waste was not a problem. And it's the same around the world. Um, the more uh, advanced technologically society is, the more waste it generates. So um, how did that change? What happened is that um, uh, probably all of you know the Industrial Revolution. In the Industrial Revolution, what you had is that some people decided to start building machines to do things faster and better, right? Why did they build machines? Because they found that machines, a machine could do uh, the work of people with, for less money and faster. And that is the beginning of the system that we are today. Basically, we have machines that are doing fantastic stuff. We have machines that basically are keeping us unemployed. I mean, I don't know the unemployment rate in Estonia, but in, in Spain, where I come from, is amazing. And around the world, if you want to compete, you have to lower salaries. Why? Because, I mean, uh, we have too many people. The machines do all the work. Mm -hmm. If you look at the production of food in the world, it's produced by machines. I mean, we have less people than ever producing food, and we have more food than ever being produced. So that was the system, but that's a system that is 200 years old. and. Um, and really what happened is that you have, um, uh, what you have to, uh, in, in the Industrial Revolution what you had is you had not too many people and machines with energy that was very cheap, it was coal, and materials that were unlimited and very cheap. And labor that was limited and very expensive. Today we have the opposite. Today we have energy that is expensive, we have materials that are scarce, and we have uh, people, we have more people than ever, and we have unemployment because these people don't find a job, right? So it's the opposite situation. And that's going to be my only economic uh, consideration here, is you understand that the way the system has been built in our society is that who pays taxes? The people. Because the people were the resource that was scarce in the past. Um, today, people pay taxes, 
and products don't pay taxes, materials don't pay taxes, energy almost doesn't pay taxes. And this is because of the, how the Industrial Revolution started. We need to change all of that. If today you would have what is scarce, what you want really to get money from, which is energy and resources being taxed, and you would re uh, remove the taxes from people, you uh, would have solved it. You will be solving the problem of unemployment because more people will have access to work because the, with, the, with the same salary um, um, you would manage to find a job. And we will reduce also the use of resources. The problem today is that because materials and resources are so cheap, the efficiency with which we use those resources is quite low. When something is expensive, you don't want to waste it. When something is cheap, you can design a plastic or a laptop to break in two years because it's quite cheap, actually, to produce a laptop. You're going to pay 500 or 1,000 euros, but it's still very cheap considering uh, that uh, all these materials come from all around the world, that you need huge amounts of water, energy to extract them, etc. So, um, that is part of the problem. If resources would be more expensive, if energy would be more expensive, what would happen is that we would design the products so that they don't break, so that we can repair them instead of throwing them away, and resources would be valuable. Today, we have the economic incentives upside down. You see, it doesn't make much sense. Uh, you want to uh, make people work, but it's very expensive to put people to work, and you want people to take care of resources and don't, not produce waste, but it's very cheap to produce waste. So the starting point is wrong. And that's what, in a way, we try to fix with, uh, with zero waste. And uh, just a second uh, small story. Um, you know the American way of life, right? Mm -hmm. That's where the second generation of waste generation started. Because until the... The Second World War, nobody was generating much waste, even, even the Americans. What happened is that even then, uh, you have heard of the Big Depression. The Big Depression, basically, what happened is that had lots of production and lots of unemployment. What happened? That all this production didn't find consumers, could not be sold. Why? Because they were producing good stuff um, that was not breaking, etc. It gets to a point that people could not buy all of that. Because they didn't have money, because they were employed. So, there was a guy called Bernard London who invented, like, what if we design things to break so that um, they're not going to last 10 years or 20 years or 30 years, they're going to last one or two years. This way, you get, you get more people working, you get more machines, you get more capital, you get the cycle faster, and everybody happy. Okay, everybody happy, you had the American way of life, you had the biggest period of growth uh, in the history of humankind. And you have there where it starts really the throwaway society that we have today, right? Because it is good for the system to uh, generate waste. Because if, we would, if things would last a long time, that would mean that, uh, well, there would be less business. And uh, of course, that would be a problem. And that's something that needs to be really fixed. Because uh, where, where we are today, we, really, we are uh, going to sink into uh, so much waste. So. The linear economy is hitting up the planet. I mean, by linear economy, uh, probably you've heard about this, is the, the throwaway society, that you extract things, then you produce them, you distribute them, consume them, and dispose of them. It's a linear process, and, it doesn't, uh, and what it leaves at the end is lots of waste. Either waste in the ground, in landfills, where it's no use, or you burn it, like uh, some people are doing in the, in the northern countries, which is no use because for every ton of waste that you burn, you get one ton of CO2, and uh, from the energetic point of view, it doesn't make any sense. Or you dispose it in the oceans or in our bodies. As I said before, the amount of chemicals, heavy metals, but also toxic pollutants, etc., we have in our bodies and in our children is amazing. We have never been as polluted as, as we are now, and all these things bioaccumulate. So, I mean, lots of these uh, uh, toxics are going to be passed to our children and our children are going to pass into our grandchildren. So it will take two or three generations if we would stop today to actually uh, clean our bodies. And of course, uh, then we have the highest rates of infertility in Europe that we have ever had. One out of every five Danish people has problems with reproduction. And that's that because they have checked. If you would check in all other countries, you would have find surprising stuff. 
um, cancer rates as well skyrocketing everywhere, etc. And nobody links that to the problem that, of course, we are putting toxics into the system and we are uh, probably having a problem with waste. But all that is linked. So, to fix all of this, um, it came the issue of the circular economy, which is basically let's make this linear economy a, cir a circle so that everything compass comes back into the cycle. We have to change the rules, shift subsidies, uh, etc. Which it looks like a sensible thing to do. Actually, if we manage to close the circle, um, then of course you will have less waste. The problem is that it's not that easy because even if we would manage to close the circle and recycle 100% of what we produce, even if we would manage to get the toxics out of the system, it would be unsustainable. Because getting to 100% recycling is, is not a solution. It's the, recycling is still the, the worst possible option after prevention and reuse. Of course, it's a lot better than, uh, than landfilling or incineration. And th that's what uh, Zero Waste uh, tries to address. And that's the issue of the ecological rucksack. Uh, does anybody here know what is the ecological rucksack or ecological footprint? Yeah. Yes. Can you explain? Melika? <laughs> you said yes. Yes, teacher. <laughs> no, no. Uh, yeah, I don't uh, remember the definition, but in my own words, it would be like this, that everything that I do has an environmental impact, and by person, how much uh, sort of like uh, footprint like uh, what I leave behind is like there is a poster where like a bird footprint is just a footprint in the sand and people yeah. also produce other things not just organic things and mm -hmm. when I take a flight and I fly to Barcelona I leave a footprint and everybody does some sort of lifestyle decisions or is forced to do that uh, can generate CO2 or any other like uh, yeah. So basically trying to bring into the, uh, for every product, what has been the cost in ecological terms to produce that. Like in this picture, for example, you see uh, this uh, proud husband, that a gold ring, for example, it takes seven tons of actually raw materials to produce a gold ring. A mobile phone that weighs 100 uh, grams has an ecological rucksack of around 65 kilos, which is uh, more than 100 times its weight. So um, that's why, the importance of understanding this is because you can recycle a mobile phone, but you cannot fix the ecological rucksack, right? I mean, you can have things that are, this is very small, this is not too much waste. But when you see like, um, I don't know, a mobile phone, for example, the important thing is not the waste that is in the mobile phone, but that really the ecological rucksack around it. And that if you recycle that, well, you get a mo another mobile phone. But if you have to produce another one, then you have 65 kilos for every 100 grams of mobile phone. And that is a vital uh, thing to understand the importance of recycling, but more than recycling of reusing. And the stupidity of, of burning or landfilling, because that means that you have to produce not that those 100 grams of mobile phone again, you have to, again, uh, extract the materials, uh, process them, manufacture them, etc. And the ecological rucksack really is what is killing the planet. Because if we look at really the amount of waste that we are generating, uh, average European generates around 500 kilograms per year of waste. Estonians are very good, if you trust the statistics, because it's around 270, 280, I don't know. I don't know how you manage to do that. Well, I, I know because I, I, I know how some of you live and... Uh, no, more. <laughs> no, no, but that, that's a good point. That's a good point, but no. Um, if I would be living in Germany, I had never been to Estonia, I would say Estonians are poor, that's why they produce so much, so little waste. Yeah, I was surprised because of Bulgaria and Romania have produced more waste than they are in the poorer. Exactly. Um, so first... I think they have done something with the statistics. Yes. <laughs> It's partly statistics, but it's partly the truth is that, I mean, if you go to Estonia outside the cities, most of the people uh, don't take out the organic waste. Organic waste is the heaviest waste that we produce. It's around 30 to 50 percent of the waste that we take out is organic waste. In Estonia, in the countryside, that doesn't get into the statistics because it's, you feed it to the animals or you do compost with it, and that's something that is not happening in, in, uh, in the rest of Europe. Well, in some places, yes, but not that often. But uh, 
but even even in Estonia, because uh, then we will need to see what is the industrial waste associated to that, what is the energy inputs, because lots of stuff is consumed in Estonia, doesn't come from Estonia, etc. But just to get an idea, an average European gets uh, produces half a million of uh, kilo, uh, sorry, half, half a ton of, of waste per year of municipal waste, what we take out, but to produce that is five tons of industrial waste to produce that, and 16 tons of raw materials to produce what in the end will be half a ton of waste. So what we see is half a ton, but what we don't see is 16 tons per inhabitant in Europe, and that's quite big, and that's the ecological, really, the ecological rucksack, which is the, the problem. So what is zero waste? And, um, and here I'm well, going to explain you what, uh, what I've been working on through the last three years, well, last five years. And um, I'm going to try to do it in three principles. The first time I came to Estonia, I did it in ten principles, and it was a bit too long, so I'm going to do it in three principles. Um, first of all, we have to make waste visible. I mean, if you have a problem of design in, a, in any process, it doesn't help to hide it. You not, need to know what is the problem in order to find a solution. So waste needs to be made very visible. Um, and then, of course, you have to design it out of, of the system. If you, if you compare what uh, the municipal solid waste, which is basically what we produce, and what the company produces, you'll see companies are a lot more efficient. Companies almost, if it's a good company that's successful over the years, they really reduce waste by 90, 95%. Why? Because they have an economic interest. They know that waste is a cost. The problem is that uh, since we just pay taxes and then we leave the municipality to deal with it, sometimes we're paying too much money for something that should be dealt in a different way. And the first thing that uh, we suggest as zero waste is really to separate the cycles, biological cycle from technical cycle. Has anybody heard of biological cycle versus technical cycle? No? That's, that's something that comes from the cradle to cradle. Cradle to cradle, sounds familiar to anybody? Yes. Ah, OK, that's better. So that's one of the main principles of cradle to cradle. That is, um, you have to separate what is organic or uh, young carbon from what is inorganic, the technical cycle. Why? Because in the biological cycle, which is basically food waste, anything that is paper, etc., the, the, the degradation of materials takes place in less than one year. Take food waste, take uh, paper, take wood, depending which conditions. In the technical cycle, if you take metals, if you take uh, plastic, if you take even uh, I don't know nuclear waste, etc., those degrade as well in the environment. It's just that it will take hundreds or uh, thousands of years. And of course, you cannot mix both because it's, you cannot recycle organic waste together with plastic because the, the, the timing is different. So one of the first things you want to do is separate uh, organics from the rest. And that's the first thing I tell to anybody who wants to start a zero waste program. You have to separate the organic waste because uh, otherwise you're going to contaminate the, the technical waste. Like if you get plastic that is dirty and you want to sell it to a plastic recycler, it would lower the value of the plastic. By, but uh, amazingly, I mean, it's, if, if, you, if you want to make money with waste, uh, you really have to make sure that the technical cycle is clean. If you contaminate it, then it needs to be cleaned, then it's, it's a mess because it's toxic, etc. So you have to separate these two. Um, to design it out of the system should be actually quite easy because, I mean, these are basically all the companies that are producing, uh, in this case, um, food, food and uh, also packaging in, in the world. Kraft, Coca-Cola, PepsiCo, Nestle, Procter & Gamble, Johnson & Johnson, Unilever, Mars, and, and Kellogg's. So basically, if there's 10 companies who change the way they do business, and the way they put packaging, we would clean a big amount of waste from the, from the seas. And that's something that can be done, I think, at the local level. Really put pressure on the distributors of all these brands around here, that you probably, most of them, you find them in Estonia, to actually say, like, we don't want to get this packaging in this kind of uh, plastic, or we don't want packaging at all. So, I mean, redesigning, really, it's also about uh, telling them uh, how to do things. And something else that we have been doing is uh, as, as zero waste is really identifying what is not recyclable. Here, this picture on the left, this is a primary school um, in, in Italy, where basically the children were taught to come back, well, to get from home 
uh, that stocker could not be uh, recycled. And then you have like single uses um, um, tableware, you have from Actimels, you have uh, different kinds of plastics, etc. And those were the children basically who sent letters to the company saying like, look, we are collecting this and we are not, uh, this cannot be recycled. Then what we did also in a zero waste municipality is also check what is in the residual waste. And uh, in, in zero waste municipalities, we are already collecting uh, separately like 80 or 90%. So we are very good at like minimizing what goes to waste. And we find a way of coffee capsules there as well. So coffee capsules is a, is, is a good example of how to mix the wrong thing, which is the coffee grounds, high in nutrients and nitrogen, etc., who can be very useful to grow mushrooms and other stuff. And you mix it with plastic or aluminum. <coughs> that if you separate that, also has a value in the market. But if you mix it together and put it with a residual waste, that has a net cost for the municipality. So what we did is we got in touch with Nespresso, we got in touch with Lavazza, and uh, Ely, etc., because that was in Italy, and, uh, and asked them actually to come up with a solution. And well, we're still in talks with them. But uh, um, of course, it's not as easy as it seems, but uh, we, we're working on it. And we, an Italian entrepreneur has come up with a very cool idea. It's basically a capsule without a capsule. Basically, you would take the coffee, you would press it very hard, and uh, you would put it in the machine. So um, just like sim as simple as that. So it's a, the packaging is the coffee itself. It's quite cool. Um, and then also we, well, about the, the phones and everything, I'm going to talk about it later. Um, but that's also a very cool thing that you could do in Estonia. That is uh, what they did in the UK, the People's Design Lab which is basically getting people together, say like, okay, we're going to see what we are using in Estonia normally, and uh, we're going to pick what cannot be recycled or cannot be repaired, or where we find that there is problems, and we're going to make it very visible. We're going to do a blog post, or we're going to do an exhibition. Like, I was in Berlin this last week, and I visited the what is work exhibition, and it was a guy, basically, who has been collecting things that are bad, basically um, designed to break, and it's getting lots of media attention. And that's a way to engage with big producers, but also with small producers. I don't know if I'll talk about it uh, later, but you have examples like the Fairphone, which is, uh, has anybody heard, heard of the Fairphone? Yeah? In the list, in the list. In the list. Uh, okay, so Fairphone, but also phone blocks. Phone blocks, no? No? Okay, let you see. Phone blocks was an initiative also from, from some guys in Amsterdam, so like, when my phone breaks, it's because always something has broken in the phone. It's not that everything breaks. Mm -hmm. So if the camera is broken, or the battery is broken, or the processor is broken, why don't we just replace the processor instead of throwing away the phone and getting a new one? So uh, what we will do is we will create different pieces of a mobile phone, so the camera, the battery, the processor, the display, etc., and you just assemble. So if you want something with a more powerful camera and a less powerful battery, or vice versa, then you build it yourself. This idea was bought by Google and Motorola, and now they are developing it in, in Silicon Valley, but I know that they are already testing it on people. So, I mean, that might come out. Don't know how successful it will be, but that's as a result of some people's like, I'm tired of throwing away the mobile phone. I want to get something that if I want, I can keep years and years. So that's an example. Principle number two is excellent separate collection. Um, that is as simple as uh, basically collecting waste uh, appropriately that you can have uh, really with good uh, source separation in the streets, but also with deposit schemes. I think Estonia has a very good um, system to separately collect the, the, the bottles, plastic bottles, glass bottles, which is quite new, but I think it works quite well, if I'm not mistaken. Um, and you should be proud of this. Where I come from in Spain, uh, it's so corrupted that it's impossible to we'll get something like this because of economic interest. Because it's, as I said, it makes those who own the waste don't want waste to be recycled. Um, still, it would be better if all of this, instead of like uh, collecting it, crushing it, and making making new bottles, you could reuse the bottles. You would just clean them and just get them reused. But that's a different story. But excellent separate collection is very important, also because you have hazardous waste. You have uh, needles, you have also batteries, and if you put batteries with the organic waste and then you put that into your garden, you're going to get some nasty stuff growing in the tomatoes. So you don't want to do that. Um, and if you basically uh, 
separate the two cycles, redesign everything without toxics, and to close the cycle. And you um, separately collect it uh, very well. In the end, you end up not needing landfills and not needing incinerators. 50% of the food in Europe goes to the bin, and you have uh, more than 100 million people in Europe who are hungry, then there's something that is not clearly not working. Um, some examples. I mean, there's a cool campaign in Germany. It's called Ugly Fruits, which has been developed by some uh, German students. It's basically to learn to love uh, ugly fruits and vegetables, because you have to know that 30 to 40 percent of the food that we that is produced is not eaten, not because it's not edible. It's just because it's not the right size or because it's ugly. You can see this potato here would not uh, would be thrown away. That carrot there is too short, and they make fun with, uh, I don't know if you understand German, but it's uh, um, the... Let's make it short. Let's make it short, yeah. But yeah, it has some sexual connotation in, uh, in German. The, the strawberry here on the right, as you can see, that strawberry would not make it to the market because it's ugly. So it only if we would change our minds, if we would accept ugly fruits and vegetables, we would save all this food from being wasted. That would mean that the food would be cheaper, we would be, have access to more food because the supply would be higher. And it's a good way to, to deal with this. Um, in Germany, there is this campaign of uh, food sharing that uh, basically uh, online you can say, I have this uh, food to, to throw away because I'm going on holidays, etc. You can come and pick it up and it's working very well. Um, there is also this uh, Feeding the 5000. I don't know if you heard of it. This is an initiative from the UK where basically um, they try to get the food from the markets and supermarkets that's being thrown away and organize uh, public uh, meals with it. And uh, two weeks ago there was the last one in Brussels and it was really, they, they filled the square. And I participate in these kind of things in Barcelona, it's really amazing. The amount, the, the amount of food but also the quality of the food that we are throwing away this is food, not that it's ugly, it's just food that is perfectly fine and it's because of the expiry date or whatever, uh, they just throw it away. It's crazy. And the peak idea, has anybody heard of the peak idea? The peak idea is, uh, is an idea from, the, from Britain, uh, from Tristram Stewart, which is uh, an environmental activist uh, that is basically trying to save the food waste and at least feed the pigs if you don't want to feed the people. This advert here is from the Second World War where basically say like, um, don't throw anything away because we need it. And uh, until 10 years ago, it was possible in Europe to feed animals with food waste because of the swine flu, that I don't want to go into details of the swine flu, but it was a whole scam. Uh, first, it was a British law, said like you cannot feed animals with food waste, and then it was European law, and now we are stuck with that. We are stuck with having to throw away food that could be eaten by people who are hungry, could be eaten by, by animals, and we cannot do that. And one of the things we try to do in zero waste is really push the European Union to change this stupid law. But, um, and of course, it's fantastic when wa food waste goes to make compost or to make biogas with it. But when it's still edible, it should be eaten by animals or, or people. Um, another example, like really how to get to, to 7%, uh, the issue of nappies. That's, uh, that's something that's really serious. I mean, now that I have a child, I, I see it and I can tell you it's really uh, is really big. And in Europe, we are 500 million people. That means around 5 million newborns per year. If you take into account that newborns that use single-use nappies are going to wear nappies for at least two years, when not three, that makes around 15, 15 million tons of waste per year. That is only nappies for children. I'm not talking about grown-ups. I mean the um, old people. 15 million tons of waste, that's around, how much waste do you produce in Estonia? You produce around half a ton, of, half a million ton. So it's like 30 times the, the, all the waste that you generate in Estonia, 30 times like that is only the amount of uh, waste that we produce with the nappies for the children. Again, it's, it's the wrong design. You have a mix of plastic, a mix of cellulose, and a mix of what, you know what, people, this, uh, smelly stuff, which is rich in nutrients that it could go back to the soils, but we don't do it because it's mixed with plastic and it's mixed with cellulose. So, of course, lots of uh, ways to reduce this, uh, this amount of waste is using um, either uh, reusable nappies or compostable nappies. Of course, there is something that you have to be careful because you have to make sure they are composted in the right way, etc. 
But reusable nappies, uh, my generation still grew up. I, I grew up with reusable nappies. There was no other option in the market. I don't know about you, probably you're younger, but I think you, you were with single use. But it's clear that in the future, we have to find a solution. I'm not saying that reusable nappies are the solution, but what I'm telling you is that we cannot continue generating, like, that every child comes to this world is going to generate one and a half tons or two tons of, all, of waste only in single use nappies. It's crazy. Because only the amount of plastic there is incredible. And poor people in the world cannot afford single use nappies. It's too expensive. Another example is, uh, is bottled water. Um, in all our communities that are zero waste, we make sure that uh, that uh, tap water is drinkable, but also that you have public fountains that on, not only provide uh, tap water, that they also provide uh, sparkling water. And that uh, you can also have free filling services for, uh, for juices and for uh, lots of other stuff. This is, uh, these are examples of, um, of buying food in bulk. I don't know if you see it very well. This upper here is in a, this upper photo is in Germany, where I was this last week. And well, they're opening shops where you can buy anything that is grain, etc., with these bags that you can reuse. So actually, they're not, you don't even have to go with a plastic bag to, to buy. This one here at the bottom is in Barcelona, and that one is in Italy. And uh, you can see there that you can buy grain, you can buy pasta, you can buy um, also um, detergents, you can buy creams, you can buy oil, honey, you name it. And the important thing with all of this is because it doesn't have much packaging, it, doesn't, it cannot come from very far away. And that's very important because, again, we are making sure that the products here are locally produced. And uh, that in Southern Europe works very well, even in Germany. In this shop in Germany, uh, all the food was coming from 100 kilometers around, the, around Berlin. So, I mean, of course, every country is a different thing, and you have to make some compromises sometimes. But it's clear that detergents, soaps, creams, these could be produced in Estonia. And you have a, a fantastic amount of cereals that we don't have in the South. So it's really a matter of adapting. But uh, this is really creating lots of local jobs in those places in the shop, in the distribution chain, but also in the production chain. And it's a way also, that, by the way, to reduce waste. I mean, all these people who shop here almost generate almost no waste. Also, it is cheaper to buy here and better quality because it's locally produced, because there's less food, less food waste, because here it's possible to sell ugly stuff. In a supermarket, they don't sell ugly stuff because people don't buy it because it's ugly. Here, I mean, they explain, well, you see this one, this is a nice artichoke and this is an ugly artichoke. The ugly artichoke, because it's ugly, it's the same as the other one, but it's, it's ugly, it's going to cost 20% less. So you know, you know it's the same one, but it's just the one poor one is ugly, and the other, or, it's, or it's smaller or bigger, and then you just buy it because it, it has really the same taste. It really doesn't make sense to, um, to pay more uh, for something just because it's beautiful. And up there is an initiative we had in, in our zero waste group in Brussels. It's basically in the markets, anybody that goes with containers, plastic containers, just sti put a sticker on it, and um, asking them to basically wash it at home and bring it back so that they can reuse it over and over again. Because all these like PET, uh, single-use um, plasticware, is really, is really a waste. And it costs money to the, to, the, to the small shops as well. So of course they are very happy that they don't have to give you those uh, plastic pots for free. Another issue is the plastic bags. Uh, we are organizing a plastic bag free day in July. Um, and well, everybody is welcome to join. I can give you more information later if you want. The sharing economy. Has anybody here heard of the sharing economy? No? The sharing economy is, is as simple as like, well, someone who has something and someone who needs something, why not just like sharing it? Um, how many people in the room have a drill at home? And the others, you don't have drills. If you need to make a hole on the wall, how do you do it? I ask friend. You ask I a friend ask for a drill. <laughs> Sorry? I ask Cardi. I ask Cardi. Not only the drill, but also for me yeah. to do it. Yeah. <laughs> Actually, that's fantastic. But that's, that's, in a way, that's sharing economy. Although most of people have a drill at home. You know what is the average use life of a, of a drill in a normal family in Europe? Three minutes. How many? Three minutes. Three minutes. You're very fast making holes, or you don't make any holes. <laughs> 13 minutes, but it's close. 13 minutes. Really, the time when you're actually making a hole with a drill is 13 minutes. 
and you're keeping a drill at home for 20 or 30 years. And then the day you use it, it happens that it doesn't work anymore because whatever. Um, so it makes sense that basically you have a drill and you share it with the community. I see you're doing here very well. You don't do that? No? Well. It doesn't make sense. It's man's world and the man needs to have his own. <laughs> <laughs> I'm serious. That's why I have drill at home because my boyfriend wasn't willing to share. <laughs> Your boyfriend doesn't share the drill with you? No, that's not me, but he doesn't borrow it. He needs to own his own tools. Okay, well, I'm not your boyfriend, but I, I, I would be happy to share the drill and the car and everything. Yeah, I mean, but it's just generalization that there are some things like we don't buy ugly fruits and we there are things that are in the world where people feel that this is something that they need to own and share. Perception true. rather, though, yeah. I, I agree. No, I agree, and I agree that there has to be a transition. I mean, if I have a drill too. <laughs> but it's because when I bought the drill, I was checking, like, can anybody, I mean, the problem is, if you move to a new place and you don't know many people, um, if you don't have a service that allows you to have this, it's a problem. Right now, the, problem, the, the thing is that with all the technology today, and uh, websites and everything, it's very easy to, to check around yourself and uh, say, okay, who has a drill? And then you basically you can borrow it. Or there are shops. I, when I was in Berlin as well, there is a shop. Basically, they, they rent these things or they give them to you for free. So you need a drill or you need a ladder or you need uh, just these kind of typical things that you use once in your lifetime and the second time you use it is already broken or without battery or all of this that we all keep in the drawers. If all of these would be available, then I would be happy to pay 10 euros or whatever to use it. But most of the time, they, they offer it for free. And uh, all this collaborative consumption it's very good for people because it's a way to meet, to meet people and overcome prejudices, but of course it's a lot less waste. I mean, imagine if a mixer or a, or a drill uh, can be shared among 200 people, it's 200 drills less that we have. Multiply that at a global level, you have a lot less waste being generated. Plus, if you have these kind of things, then of course um, the producers are going to take care that they will break a lot less because they want to make sure that they sell something that lasts for a long time. A uh, producer of, of drills or things like this, they know that you're going to use it once or twice, that you bought it because you need to make a hole and then you will forget about it. So the next time you're going to use it, probably it's not going to work. And that's, that's very important. I mean, this is an example of a community of, in, uh, that's a little community in Leeds in the UK. And it's very cool because, I mean, they have built a cooperative of houses. It's, well, these are all houses made with, with straw and that they have a lake, they grow their own food, but they also, and of course, I mean, these are all passive houses, they don't consume energy. Basically, they generate energy they put into the grid for a lower cost than what it would have costed to produce actually modern houses with uh, force aeration, etc. But they also have a place where they share the washing machine, they, they share cars, so they have some cars, but they, they're sharing them. Um, so really, I mean, and it's working very well, and they have very low expenses. And they are all very happy. I, I know them, and they very happy people. So these are just examples of the reuse part. And the Wallapop, has anybody heard of Wallapop here? No? Yes? How come? Vodafone. Vodafone, no, no, Wallapop. Oh. Wallapop, no, OK. That's an application that is it's a, it's a startup uh, from a couple of French people who basically said, OK, it's an application that well, you can download at any moment, and you can check around yourself basically who has things to share that is really close to where you live. So say, uh, I want to buy a small bicycle for my child. So you will just check and around yourself, you will find black people who are selling that for really no money. So it's a kind of an online uh, second-hand market, but proximity. It's not that you're going to buy something from the other side of the world. It's, it's something that's very close. And there's other networks like Nolotiro in Spain, where basically you put there what you don't want. Like my old laptop, um, it was still working, but I didn't want to send it for recycling. I put it there, and a family who could not afford the laptop basically got this laptop from me, and they were very happy, and I got to know them, and it's very cool. Repair cafes are also um, very interesting. Uh, do you have repair cafes in Estonia? Yeah? Yes. Mm -hmm. and I uh, but in a bigger scale, I remember maybe it was last time, it was the first time in uh, Tallinn Technical University, and they had this huge yes. festival, basically. But it was like a, like a project. Yeah. It's not permanent. Yeah, it's not permanent. I don't know if there are any permanent ones. Well, there's no permanent ones. Normally, the idea is like you will come, out, come together every two or three weeks or every month or whenever people want, 
and bring things that they cannot repair, and they just have people who help uh, to repair stuff. We started in Holland, and it's it's working quite well. And it's it's not only about repairing stuff; it's also about sharing experiences. But it's also about sharing uh, experience, uh, information about why do things break, and which brands make things in which way that they break, and uh, that's quite useful. The I Fix It. Um, is, a, is an online community also basically um, writes manuals of how to repair things. And they can also sell, sell you the tools to do that online. And that's, that's quite cool. Basically, you can uh, check that. On waste sorting, very quickly, you have um, many examples in Europe of basically motivated people. There is uh, Karen Cannard in the UK, who was uh, just a housewife, who decided that uh, she didn't want to generate as much waste. And uh, she started separating in a couple of weeks she cut the waste she was taking out in half, and in six months, the only thing she took out was plaster. And they're just an average citizen. And she was so happy with the result that started with a zero waste week in the UK, and got 572 families to go for zero waste. So, as you can see, if they do it, we can also do it. I mean, some people here as well maybe know Paul Martinson from Sweden, and he started separating waste at home, so put the glass, paper, plastics, etc., and organics and everything. And he counted that in one month, four people in Sweden produced 60 kilograms of waste, which is basically 15 kilograms per person. And the residual part of that, what cannot be recycled, was 1.6%. Meaning that if everybody would do what Paul Martinson is doing in Sweden, they could close all the incinerators in Sweden, and they have a lot. So you see, only the, by, by source separating. So very quickly, this is how traditional waste management looks like. Disposal is 60 to 80 percent. The rest is reuse, recycle, composting. Um, and then the question in, with this scenario is, what is it better? To landfill, to bury, to burn, etc. And of course, that is the wrong question. In a zero waste scenario, at least to start with, you see that composting grows a lot more, recycling grows repair and reuse grows, and the residual waste is a lot, it's, it's really marginal, it's 10%, it's 20% maximum, and we are working with places that they are now at 4%, and those places where we are at 7 kilos per person per year, I mean, really, I mean, that's less than 4% than of the total waste, which means that, of course, the pollution that they, they are, and the amount of waste they are generating is not felt by the society. Rivers are clean, forests are clean, no need to go clean up anything. So that's for the, for the, clean up, for the people who like cleaning. That would be a disaster. But, um, but sooner or later, I guess you want to find Don't another hobby, us. right? Don't scare us. Sooner or later, you should have, well, you know. So how does this look in practice? This is the example of Capanoris. The, it's the first uh, city that to declare zero waste in Europe in 2008. They thought they were crazy. Well, not them, the others. They were basically following the example of San Francisco, who declared the zero waste goal already in the 90s, and they are already recycling around 80%. But very quickly, you see, in blue is separately collected waste that is going to recycling. And in dark, that would be what is going to dispose of, but that time was incinerator and then landfill. And as you can see, the blue part goes up, the dark part goes down, but also the, the amount of waste generated also goes down thanks to the waste reduction policies that I mentioned, like uh, buying in bulk, uh, water fountains, uh, reusable nappies, etc. So you got to 82% separate collection, but 40% of waste reduction. So basically, they, it leaves you with uh, less than 15% of waste to landfill or burn. Of course, uh, Capanori is in that region where basically they have banned incineration because it doesn't make sense to build incinerators anymore in a place where you don't have waste. It will be just a waste of money. This is a, a map of uh, zero waste municipalities in Europe that for the moment you can see with, uh, they're mainly in Italy and in Spain. But we're going to have, we're having now talks in people, with people in France and in the Netherlands with these uh, municipalities that I told you about. And also in Berlin. I was in Berlin last, last week. And uh, we're having more and more uh, municipalities are jumping on board, basically declaring the goal to zero waste and moving in that direction. And yeah, well, the yes, we can. Here we have Rosano Polini, who is the, the crazy uh, primary school teacher 
that in 1997 started fighting against the incinerator they had built next to the school where he was teaching. And everybody was saying that I was crazy at that time. And he led the zero waste movement in first in Capanori, then in northern Italy, and now in Italy. And last year, he won the Goldman Prize Award because it showed that it's not only about opposing something. They came up with an alternative that is creating more jobs, that is saving money, that is making people actually happier. And uh, it's been recognized with a, with a Green Nobel Prize. And I think it's a, it's a very good story. And uh, the cool thing about the Zero Waste Movement is that I'm seeing lots of Rosanos or lots of these heroes uh, appearing in many places in Europe. I can give you many examples. But again, the yes, we can, and uh, Obama is a good example, is yes, probably he can. But um, it's not that easy. I mean, uh, it's a huge commitment. But it can be done, and good political will doesn't come alone. I mean, you need to push it. If you want Estonia to become a zero waste country, it's not going to come because your president or your prime minister sees the light. It's going to come because you are going to push them in the direction to go this way. Otherwise, do you political, uh, politicians ever see the light, <laughs> or they only need to be shown the light? The, politic the, the politicians are there because you have put them there. So theoretically, they are, you have the joystick. But uh, in the zero waste uh, experience, do. have you ever they seen do. any of those colleagues like, in the political field? Yeah. yeah. No, but that, that's, I think that's one of the most rewarding things with zero waste, that you see that okay. some politicians okay. uh, are there because they believe in something. And after 20 years, they don't remember what they were believing 20 years <laughs> before. But, uh, but some of them do, especially those who spend like five years, 10 years in politics. But Politicians, most of them, except the corrupt ones, want to do the right thing. It's just that, I mean, when you are in politics, it's difficult to do the right thing when you're alone, when you don't have support from the people. If you get people pushing you from the back and basically supporting you, it's easier to do the right thing. And that's, that's the amazing thing. I can tell you, I met amazing mayors that uh, you would listen to this mayor and you would think he is an activist. And he's not an activist, it's a mayor. Or he's a president of a waste company, etc. Like now in Slovenia, for example, I'm working there with a couple of municipalities, and it's amazing. Even with Ljubljana, we are managing to turn politicians into activists. And then when you have politicians who are committed and activists pushing, then the change is, is happening. To my surprise, I also was thinking that this was impossible, but it's, it's possible. I mean, at the end of the day, it is in your hands. And basically, that's what I have to say. Aita. And uh, if you have questions, let me know. Now, what is the most, uh, like the best tip that you can give uh, if somebody uh, wants to start uh, pushing towards, like, let's say, zero waste municipality anyway? W which, like, arguments work the best, or where do you have to start, really? Like, uh... well, you have to know who are you talking to. Are you talking to a politician? Are you talking to a let's say businessman? A politician. Let's say a politician. Well, it's, yeah. If you're talking to a politician, um, then it depends. If, if you have lots of waste in the street, so you have a waste problem, or the, the city really has economic problems, or lots of unemployment, it depends on the angle. But you can say that if you go zero waste, you're going to have less waste. Less waste means less cost for the municipality to manage waste. Less waste means that uh, more waste will go to recycling, meaning more jobs will be created more local jobs, um, and it's going to be better for the economy. In any case, it's important to emphasize always that this is not an environmental issue. As I said before, it's environmental, but it's also economical, and it's also about the future. The health aspect is also very important. In the mid-long term, as I said, I think we're going to face a lot of uh, problems with the health of the citizens, which in a way is good for the economy. It means more hospitals, more doctors, dealing with sick people, but it's, of course, it's not good for, for our children. So, I mean, um, using this angle is also useful. Have you said that Estonia, uh, you said that Estonia is a good example, or uh, we have low uh, waste generation per capita, but is it low uh, in comparison with other countries, or low as it's sustainable? Well, sustainable, sustainable, no, I mean, it's low in comparison Estonia, basically, what it has is it has quite good recycling rates, according to the statistics, around 40%, and it's not generating too much waste. 
which means that combining these two things in comparison with the rest of European countries is doing very well. It's actually the best. Um, but of course, uh, when you look at, for example, um, industrial waste in Estonia, you see that you have a problem there because most of your energy comes from shale oil, I mean oil shale, and that's extremely polluting. So it really depends how you compare it. Have you met the anti lobby uh, from uh, from producers or uh, or uh, politicians? Because uh, actually zero waste means uh, less consumption, means uh, this is not very profitable uh, for uh, for uh, producers. No, well, when and less waste means also uh, less profit in generations. Mm -hmm. Well, that's true. I mean, zero waste means. No incineration business, no landfill business, and that the producers will have to change the system of production. Meaning that instead of selling so much units and forgetting about them, they will have to invest in systems that are reusing. So for example, if you're selling washing machines, you're going to sell maybe 20 times washing machines, less. But you're going to, you can create more jobs and more economy by providing spare parts repair, etc. So the thing is that you have to readapt uh, to the new market. If you, it's go there's going to be less waste, there's going to be less energy inputs, but you as a producer will mean that you don't produce units that are designed to break, you're going to produce units that you may be leasing, you're not selling anymore. Because that one of the problems that uh, they have today is that they sell stuff, but what they sell has important and um, expensive materials in it. If you rent it instead of uh, selling it, you make sure that you own the machine. So actually you don't have the cost of the machine because it's all the time yours as a company. And the only thing you're doing is you're leasing the materials and if it breaks or anything, you just uh, send someone to repair or to, to change a part. So you are the owner of the materials, you have more employees because you are repairing, and of course it's a different economy. You are selling less, but you are providing more services. You turn into a into a good provider, into a service provider. But it's possible if you're intelligent really to, uh, to adapt to the new market. It doesn't need to be less consumption as such. It needs to be less wasting, uh, but of course, we will still have a washing machine. Just that you might not own it, it might not break, and you don't have to change it every two or three years. Do you have collected enough like, really positive uh, practices from businesses where they have changed it so that you can present uh, this skeptical businessman like, look, this uh, organization used to be like you, they changed it, now they're more profitable, they have more smart mm. jobs, uh, better social impact, whatever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's actually not us, that's um, there's the Circular Economy from Ellen MacArthur Foundation, but also it's the Cradle to Cradle, who basically work from the business point of view. So, for example, there was now, the, I think it's called Delo, which is a uh, uh, a company in the Netherlands who has been selling uh, carpets, right? And they had the business of selling carpets, also interface in the U in the US, and they have changed the whole business of selling carpets that were made of uh, of basically of plastic, it was single use that you had to throw away afterwards, and the only thing you could do actually was burn them. So okay, we're going to uh, sell carpets, but we are going to rent the carpets, and we're going to make sure that if something gets stained or damaged, we're going to replace only that part of the carpet. And it's not only that we're selling carpets, we're also selling better air. Because most of the carpets, basically, they, they, they get uh, animals, you know, they get insects, etc. They get actually bad for, uh, for the air. And what these carpets do is actually clean the air. And this company has been growing at 20-30% for the last years. And examples like this, there are a lot more in different sectors. And actually, I mean, there's a thing is Renault, who is starting to lease cars. Because in the future, if you're going to have electric cars, the battery is going to be very expensive. And if the car producers can, they don't want to sell you the battery, they want to keep the battery. Because the battery is going to continue to increase the price over time. So if you are a wise producer, you want to make sure that you, you just rent the battery, you don't sell it. And uh, they are trying to implement this. But of course, as I said, the market incentives are not there yet, but there's lots of examples of companies that I can provide you a list. That we, it's not our list, that is from, a, from cradle to cradle, that is from a, a circular economy. We work more with, with local producers, but with, for local producers, I mean, it's clear that I mean, they are producing and selling more than ever, but it's because they were not there before. Could you please give more examples of 
just renting items, not selling them? Ah, let's see. Um, what did I say? Washing machines? I said uh, bicycles, for example. If you go to Barcelona, or, or all this uh, bike sharing that you have, um, instead of uh, having a bicycle yourself that is going to be 15 kilos or whatever of material that you have at home, in Barcelona I don't have a bicycle because I can use the public system. Wow. And it is something that we have more and more in Europe, of, of these laundry services. It doesn't cost much money to start, of course it, it is a mentality change. Because, I mean, are people going to be willing to share nappies? I mean, I don't see the problem, but I mean, some people, as you said, your boyfriend doesn't want to share the drill. Um, you want to share the nappies, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> What's the second step that you can do as a like, household? Like, first of all, that the, well, I think most of here, they already separate their uh, mm -hmm. bio waste, and it's, it, you should anyway. Uh, but what's the second step that you could do as a regular person who works in the situation, let's say, like Estonia? What else can we do to move more towards zero waste? What's the second biggest step? Well, at a personal level, I mean, the way you shop and where you shop, I think it makes a difference as well. If you, depends, I don't know where you buy the stuff, and when it comes to food, buying in markets normally it comes, especially if it's a seasonal food, it comes with less packaging than if you try to buy oranges in the supermarket. Um, and also, yeah, this kind of stuff. Uh, using reuse stuff, like if you have a baby, like second-hand clothes. But this is at, at the local level. I mean, it's really, once you have separated, then it's a matter of like responsible consumption. And then the third level, I would say, is just like try to fix the things that the market doesn't offer. Like, I agree that if you have to wash your own nappies, it's a pain. But if you get together with 10 different mothers, and you basically want just clean the nappies for everybody, it makes it more bearable. Uh, the same for food, the same for uh, clothes, the same for cars, the same for other stuff. So if people get together, you can share stuff instead of having to, to own it. How do you see where the world is headed? And um, we eventually have to make huge changes anyway, which we're just whether it's just because we run out of resources or just because we are facing such a huge economical catastrophe. Um, zero waste could be just you know, the perfect way of living, but adaption to it economically is pretty painful because this is not how e economy is supposed to work. And at some point there will be, a, even if not a um, decrease of, um, of economic growth, but just maybe slow down. Then, or even today, people are saying that if economical growth in China even reduces a few percentages, then then it's a huge catastrophe. So, adaption to this, uh, how do you see it? it? It could be without really big pain and, and unemployment and suffering. Well, the, the pain and the unemployment we have it now. Anyway. I think that the well, anyway, the thing is that the system that we're trying to create, I mean, we have to make sure that it creates employment and as less pain as possible. I don't see this transition as a pain. I mean, from the macroeconomic point of view, if you look at things from the kind of a GDP growth, then you are stuck, because it's impossible to continue to have GDP growth in a place, in a world with finite resources. It just, it just doesn't add up. But from the, I, I cite economics, and uh, this way of measuring uh, economics only with GDP growth is something that started in the Second World War together with the throwaway linear society in the US, etc. Um, because they need really to generate growth, to generate employment, etc. But this is not going to be the indicator in the future. In fact, the European Commission is working on new indicators to measure uh, things differently. I mean, as I said, if you break your arm, it's good for the economy. If you go to war and you produce weapons and you kill lots of people, that means more money for the hospitals, more money for the weapon producers, uh, more money for the person who's going to send you to the cemetery, etc. That's that means GDP goes up. Taxes. Less taxes. Well, and less taxes for one person. Uh, more people to, who are like uh, handicapped and people who you have to take care of if the country. Yeah, more useful to kill them, not leave them. Of course, but what I mean is that the, what the GDP growth measures is a, a economic activity. Does it measure if the economic activity is good or is bad? If you have a country that has a very good GDP growth, 
but then it has a, a really huge social inequalities. It's, it really doesn't measure uh, happiness, it doesn't measure the quality of consumption, doesn't matter the sustainability, doesn't me measure these kind of things. So, um, in a way or another, we'll have to like, move away from these indicators. And you can have countries, and I'm convinced that you can have decreasing GDP, but at the same time, you can have uh, uh, raising happiness or includes even increasing consumption. You can increase consumption, the good consumption, and decrease the GDP. But that's an issue with macroeconomics and indicators that I can tell you a lot about because I worked in this since a long time and I've been advising the European Commission on, on this. And it's difficult because we don't find indicators that like, like GDP growth. Is, it can say, okay, if GDP grows, we are all happy. Everything goes well. Because it's not like that. And again, a GDP that grows and is generating the wrong kind of employment, say like, for example, opening new mines or these kind of things, um, it's not going to help. You want to have GDP growth, but with healthy, with healthy measures. So I don't think it's going to be painful. I don't think it's going to create unemployment, because that's what we have now. You have a situation where it's painful. It's creating unemployment, and it's not getting better. We have to create a system that allows us to live in this planet with uh, limited resources, keeping the same amount of, uh, of goods. I want to continue eating what I'm eating. I want to continue having, uh, using a drill if I need, using a car, using a bicycle. Uh, having a, a child care for my baby, etc., all these kind of things. But at the same time, I don't want to believe in a planet that is going to help. And I think that that is possible, and that's what we're trying to do with Zero Waste. And actually, the European Commission is also supporting this, because we organize regular conferences in the European Parliament, uh, presenting examples, practical examples of cities or municipalities that follow this path. And you see that they save money in the, in the waste collection, you see that they create occupation, they see it's good for the local economy because they have more local shops to sell uh, food without packaging, to uh, have second-hand uh, stores, to have repair shops, all these kind of things, which at the same time creates innovation. You have uh, innovation people who need to innovate in the marketing because you have to sell a new way of doing things, people who innovate in other stuff. So really, we are showing practical examples of concrete communities that actually there it should go very bad because GDP in a way is going down, but no, GDP is being stable but the rest is going up. And, um, and the European Commission said, okay, we have to go this way. But why are they so slow at this? Because, of course, the European Commission doesn't have the power to tell the countries to do this or do that. We're going to have a review of the waste uh, targets uh, next year, and the Commission is going to suggest higher recycling, higher reuse, higher prevention, but the member states can do it the way they want, or they can uh, just tweak the statistics like many governments do, it's just like, okay, let, we're going to put 60% recycling. Still, 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 still. For? We, can, we can be happy in Estonia. We are really moving to the yeah. towards zero waste uh, country. Because first, we don't have any landfilling anymore. It's, it's over already some two years, maybe, mm -hmm. ago. And now we are, <coughs> are, 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 are preparing the, the solutions how to degrees the amount of waste that's going to the to this burning factory, the factory in one of them. And it's, it's like uh, we skipped the uh, lowest level of hierarchy of uh, waste management, mm -hmm. now we're going to the next level, and this of course is the most... If that happens, it will be fantastic. Yeah. And it, it works. And now it's, it's, it's in Estonia, I don't see that uh, the big issue uh, about uh, jobs or, or, or economic, economical influence, it's more a question of the mentality. Of the thinking that what I'm doing, I, I'm, I'm rich, I can I can waste. No, I can I'm rich, I can I can be responsible. Yeah, that's the way. Still, our energy uh, producing is not the most sustainable. How we it produce our energy? Second bad. Yeah. Now we are moving lower. We were in the lowest level. Uh, it's not maybe too well, anyway, it's too naive to, to say that we are uh, moving to a zero waste actually. All our steps is toward zero waste. Zero waste is a direction. It's, I mean, of course, getting to zero waste is, is almost <coughs> impossible, but the important thing is to go in that direction. Uh, well, it's true, it could be worse. I mean, I don't understand why you had to build an incinerator right now, but, uh, but still, I mean, it's true, you have low waste generation, and you have quite acceptable recycling rates, and the progression from the last years is getting better and better. So that, as long as it, this doesn't stop, is going the right direction. But I really like the issue of um, really how to 
change the mentality of people so that consuming less or consuming in a different way, it actually looks cooler. And that I think that's uh, one of the major challenges of zero waste, all these kind of things, is about marketing. You have to sell something that at the moment is counterintuitive. Because as I explained, since the American way of life of the uh, 1940s, what is cool is to buy as much as possible, to have your own car, to have your washing machine, to have a big house, and we have to change this mentality. That is possible. We know that it, you don't need all of this to be happy, and actually, the bigger your house is and the more cars you have, the more problems you have. So it's all a matter of marketing as well. Yeah. More change in the mentality. Uh, I'm very curious, have you ever met those, um, to say, uh, let's say, uh, rich people yeah, that actually uh, usually don't think about things like things like this, and uh, you face that actually their mentality is changing, and they would prefer, for example, to rent a carpet, not to buy it. You know, they don't give a... Yeah. Well, it depends. ...about this renting and, and, and wasting and all these things. Of course, I mean, you don't have to go into this matter of detail, but it's important to see the tendency. And I can tell you there's more people, rich people today that think in these terms than there were 10 years ago. Because 10 years ago, all the rich people wanted to basically have as much as possible, have as much money as possible. And right now, I can tell you, I mean, rich people and politicians, it's true that they're mostly in the UK, uh, France, uh, US, etc. But I'm also seeing them a bit everywhere. Even in Asia, I can tell you, I met them. So it's true, I mean, it's, it's a major change because the moment that all the rich people start thinking like that, then it's a, it's a major thing. Because but you don't need so much. Maybe you don't have to become rich. You don't want to become rich. You want to spend your time otherwise, not work so much. Yeah? What would the rich mean? <laughs> ah, yeah. Wait, oh. when, when? <laughs> yeah, when? You have stupid money or? Uh, yeah. Exactly, but that's what I mean. That's, that's the marketing point of view. I mean, what does being rich mean these days? Being rich means having three cars or having three happy children? Or many modern or diseases. Oh, but exactly. You can be rich and obese, full of toxics. I mean, with, I mean, oh, you see? Really, uh, rich has been associated to material wealth. And I think that rich uh, should be associated to kind of uh, prosperity or, uh, or w general well-being. And we get to that level basically when we have our basic demands uh, covered. But that's what we need to, to change. And that's why I'm saying that the, the, at the end is a, is a challenge that comes <coughs> with the marketing, really. What does being rich mean? No, I'm saying rich, I, me personally mean that uh, I imagine the person who has, for example, a uh, Porsche Cayenne, and he really doesn't care about anything. You know, um, um, I, uh, my friend was organizing the events like this, wh which topic was just green thinking and mm -hmm. uh, and and uh, things like this. So, uh, and I was near nearby her when she invited one one person to this event, and she, he said like word by word, I mean, almost like, you know what, I have everything and I don't need anything and I don't care about things like this, you know. So, uh, the, this this meaning of richness. But it's not a I matter mean. of uh, richness. You see a lot of people who don't have much and they should save, but everything they get, they throw away and waste like the, mm -hmm. uh, quick loans and whatever, you know, just to get, get, get and then don't think about the sustainability. <laughs> maybe not connected to things. I mean, there are actually so small percentage of rich people in the society anyway. So then, then even if all of them are wasteful, then it's a small percentage of uh, wasteful people. <coughs> what, the, what the rest is doing is also very important. It's a the middle rather. class is maybe the, the target group. Yeah. I, was, I was wondering, do you have like, um, how do you train the municipalities and communities to, to behave in a zero waste way because I mean probably when they are getting interested they think okay let's start the hippie community here well us together and uh, but what should we do then yeah. <laughs> how well, because zero waste is not really of course it's about changing your life and your perspective but what we say is that you don't don't isolate yourself from the world what you want to do is make sure that you change the world for the others and uh, how we do it normally is that the local groups get organized and try to uh, push the municipality, try to go to the city council, explain the concept, uh, study how things are being run these days, could it be done in a different way, I mean, what could be improved, 
and then try to pass a zero waste resolution in the, in the city council, saying by 2020, 2025, we're going to reduce uh, waste in 90%, uh, and in order to get there, we get first we're going to do this, we're going to do that, etc. And that's working quite well. That's what we're, how we are engaging with uh, municipalities. Basically, explaining politicians normally don't understand these things. You have to give really first explain them, and then really take them by the hand and walk them that way. And of course, it helps if the waste management companies, etc., are agree with you. So, but it's not that difficult, honestly. I'm. Um, from what I've seen, we are working now with more than 300 municipalities and it's working quite well. And after the municipality comes the regional or the national level. In Italy, we are about to pass a zero waste law, which of course 10 years ago would have been impossible to think, but when you have more than 100 municipalities behind you, then it's easier to get to the parliament and say we want to do this. So. Uh, what, do you, what do you think about Napoli? Uh, do you think the, this, the city has uh, some chances to be back to normal. You definitely know the situation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I've been involved in Naples since 2008. And that, that's a cool thing. I mean, have you seen Naples in the news lately? Is it changed? Well, have you seen Naples in the news? No, but uh, I was there rather no. recently. It was maybe not like totally, nobody was striking, but the situation was really bad. Like the National Park of Azulia is basically a land -based. Yeah, yeah. Awful. yeah, well, okay. The, the issue with Naples, because of course that's where the Gomorra, the mafia, and all of that. Well, it's Naples was has been dominated by the mafia since uh, now I would say it's around 10 years, 15 years. And it's true that they were, it came to a time when it was in TV, when the waste was in the streets, it was burning and everything, and that was a mess. And I agree, that was controlled by the mafia. The European uh, Union throw money into that to build two incinerators. It never worked because the mafia was blowing them up. The, the national government put a, a person there because they didn't trust that the elected politicians would not be um, following instructions from the mafia, and nothing worked. Then in 2009, with the zero waste groups, we organized like a big demonstration there. Basically, we pointed the finger at the, even the person that nominated by Rome uh, was corrupt, and we started to change things. And uh, say like this, it's not a matter of building incinerators, or it's not a matter of like sending the army here. What you need to do, the only thing you need to do, is really to start separating waste. And if you separate waste and you distribute kind of like the, the goods, the risks, you basically, the mafia will not, will, mafia wants big amounts of uh, money, lots of waste, all together, and then throw it into the Vesuvio, or things like this. If you go to the area, it's true, it's, it's, it's fully polluted. Campania will have, uh, will need decades to clean all of that. It's been lots of years of dumping a waste coming from northern Italy, even nuclear waste has been dumped in the, in the, in the fields there. So of course, it doesn't have any, an easy solution. I can tell you that the situation is very bad. But in 2010, uh, there were elections in, the, in, in Naples, and the party that was supporting zero waste uh, got elected. I'm not, I'm not saying they did everything right, but 60% of the, of the town now is doing door-to-door -door separate collection. In the beginning, they had to start separating the waste with the army because they were shooting at those who were, uh, uh, the mafia was shooting at the, those collecting the waste. It's hard to imagine, but of course that was not in the media. And, uh, but it got normalized, and now more than 60% of, I would say around 75% of the people in Naples are separately collecting waste. And it's, so the city center, what people see when they go there, is still a bit of a mess. But the rest, that's why it's not in the news, because it's good news. And they're separating like 60 or 70% of the waste, which is more than what Paris, or London, or any other big city is separating you. It just, of course. What happens when they separate it, like uh, door to door? Uh, they take it. Is it uh, isn't isn't uh, uh, waste management controlled by mafia still? Like when it no. reaches, they still can put it together into whatever they want to burn it or like. No, because uh, the municipality makes sure that you, you separate the waste, and when you have it separated, the organics are going to a composting facility that is controlled and is far away. And if, and if the waste streams are clean, then there is a, there's an economic interest to get that plastic that is clean because it has a value. The problem is that you have everything together, it is a net cost. And the market says, okay, I'll take this cost. Which, because they're like, I'm going to charge you 50 or 60 euros per ton, because that's the cost of like sending it to landfill, but I'm not going to send it to a landfill. I'm going to throw it into whatever, which is my cost is zero, and I charge 50 or 60 per ton, fantastic. 
If instead of being a cost because you have separated it, it has a value, the plastics, the metal, the paper, etc., then the, the is, it's not a cost, it's, a, it's a actually an asset. So um, nobody wants to uh, see that as a waste and they want to sell it into the market and the mafia then, at least the mafia wants to start recycling. So like I have a recycling facility, give me the plastic. But it's stupid because the mafia will not get paid for getting that plastic. Mafia will have to pay for that plastic. And therefore, once you have paid for that, you want to recycle it. You don't want to dump it because it will be stupid otherwise. I see a good marketing campaign like the even mafia is recycling. <laughs> well, I'll try. I will. It's a joke. No, 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 no. But um, but you see, it's it's uh, and that perhaps that Naples is probably the the most famous case. But I've seen that happening in other places, and it's not a coincidence that all of this movement started in Italy, because it was probably one of the most I would not say the most but uh, corrupted places. But if you go to Spain, you go to Romania, you go to Bulgaria, even if you go to Germany, there's a uh, waste mafia bit everywhere. It's actually from the student campaigns, I can say that I wish there were more Naples because the more visible the problem is, the more uh, reaction you get. It's, it's difficult in the places where you don't see the problem, where it's hidden and everything seems normal. That's, like in that's, Germany or the Yeah, in very developed countries, that's where the problem is because everybody thinks that somebody else is dealing with it. They don't really see the problem and nobody then yeah, is so passionately willing to take this up. And in Naples, where well, I've been there, and these people are just absolutely fantastic. They are just, they, are, they have their heart in it, and that's what they're doing, and that's, that's their life, that's their hope. Here, you don't, you don't see the problems, so you don't see that there's something worth, uh, worth, worth needed to defend them. Eric, you, you said that it's very important for zero waste also to visualize the trash, right, in a way that to put it in the picture. It's the same for let's do it, but how do you visualize it in the countries, let's say, like Netherlands or Germany? Well, you take a different approach. I mean, in Germany or in the Netherlands, uh, I'm working a lot with them lately. As you, it's, it's not a matter of separating organics because they're already doing that, but then it gets to the level of redesign. Say, okay, I mean, this. The I fix it uh, Europe is in Germany, and what they do is actually they analyze electronic goods and say, okay, this has, this is designed to fail in this condenser or this accumulator, etc., so things like that. Or repair guides, the repair cafe started in the Netherlands, so you can say that they are doing quite well with waste. But on the other hand, um, they still spend a lot of uh, like taxpayers' money on uh, waste yeah. management instead of investing in what they could say for education or integration or health or whatever? They have very expensive waste management systems because they have to still sustain lots of incinerators and they collect in the waste with, uh, with big trucks and they still generate lots of waste. But in those countries, really we're working a lot on the redesign. That's why the cradle to cradle concept is in the Netherlands and in Germany and uh, all the redesign, uh, the issue of toxics, the issue of uh, uh, the phone blocks that I talked about, the fair phone, all these things started in the Netherlands. So, of course, it's, a different, it's not that urgency that we have in Southern Europe or some places in Eastern Europe, but they also do in their bit. And they also, I mean, you from Let's Do It, you know that they also have problems with the plastic in, in the Netherlands. And it's been in the Netherlands where they have banned the micro bits from the, from the soap. You know that? The, so that, that's a thing in the Netherlands. All the plastic, the PET that is in the, as exfoliant for, for, the, for the soaps. And that happened in the Netherlands. It didn't happen in Italy because they have other priorities, of course. They, they, they don't care about the microplastics because of what they have with the big plastics and the big waste. So. But where do you get your energy and courage <laughs> to do all this? Because you are speaking throughout Europe all the time, and uh, where do you get your energy, courage, most of all? Have you ever been threatened? <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> but I'm not. I'm not saying anything. I'm. I mean, the the people like Rosano, people. I, I deal with people that actually are dealing with really the hard stuff. It's actually go to talk. Most of you here uh, agree with what I'm saying, more or less. No, oh. yes, after two hours, uh, but. <laughs> But the difficult part is really to talk to, go to talk to people who actually don't want to listen. Or to, to, to go to the, talk to, to these rich people, to big companies, or things like this. 
and all that's being done by people, uh, normal people, to actually don't know th anything about waste, but they say, I don't want to have these toxics, I don't want to have this waste, etc. And then they start from the local level, and they, they change the world. So uh, the energy comes from there. And also, actually, because I'm seeing things changing. When I started with this 10 years ago, I mean, I, I thought I would last one or two years. I started economics. I have nothing to do with waste. I mean, for me, waste is a way to change uh, the way production takes place and to get toxics out of the system. And the energy I get because I see that it's working. Because I'm changing more things uh, like this than I could do in any other way. And honestly, I mean, when you see what is happening at the local level, it's really mind blowing. I mean, I've seen, and some of you who have been coming to some zero waste excursions, it's amazing what you see. There are like people who are like uh, throwing a huge amounts of waste, and now it's like, no, no, I, I'm not thinking of waste. I just take the organics, and they will know everything, etc. And uh, it's cool. It's cool to turn normal people into activists without knowing. It's, it's fantastic. And that's basically where the energy comes from. And I don't think I'm doing anything special. Huh? I mean, I think that you take care of your children, and I take care of my child in a different way. Just that my job is a bit more weird. Another, uh, another personal question. Have you ever had a car? No. Good. <laughs> because I do have, and Estonians are like that. that uh, when you were uh, talking about um, uh, sharing your car, I don't know many Estonians who want to share their car. I don't have a car. <laughs> but a lot of, uh, when um, I live at the countryside and I, I need to have a car, and but I'm willing to share it, but I know a lot of people who will never share their car, as your boyfriend will never share his drink. No, he can share, but he won't borrow. Okay. okay. He owns a construction yeah. company, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and he needs to own something. Yeah. <laughs> but you have to think bigger in these cases. It's true. Yeah. I mean, sometimes you cannot change this, but it's because, I mean, I would need to have a car if I could not go where I want to go with public transport, or by borrowing the car of my friend, or having car sharing, etc. I'm lucky to live in places where there's public transport that works, where the car sharing works. I've been, I have lived in Brussels, I lived in Barcelona, I lived in Berlin, in New York, in California. It's always been car sharing, people who I could borrow the car from, or I could take the public transport, or the bicycle. So why should I own a car? I ask it because it's a really good example, this car issue. It's a it's a, as you said, it's a bigger picture, so you have to see a big, big, bigger uh, picture in this. So I think this car issue is uh, one good uh, example. This is uh, the way of uh, trying to uh, change people, uh, how they think. So uh, we have a lot to do in Estonia. But also... In but actually, this car issue, there is this one new service auto levy yes, yes. Uh, and well you basically rent out your car for a period of time mm -hmm. and uh, this way it's easier for you to maintain your car and for a person who needs it for a day or two uh, maybe to rent it so there there are are things it's maybe it's not too popular right now but it hasn't been going on for a long time either mm -hmm. so. it's like people rent out their homes yes yeah, like the Airbnb or the blah blah. I don't know if you have blah blah car, car here in in Estonia, but in Germany, which is the country in Europe that is more addicted to cars, they are the biggest car producers in the world. The car sales have dropped, and the the car sharing has really skyrocketed in the last years. Which means that Germans who basically had cars in the past don't own cars these days because with this blah blah car, like with a uh, Wallapop, basically you can check I want to go that place. Who is going that way? And, and you organize yourself and you go. And, um, and it's like that. And if that happens in Germany, we basically, I, all my German friends, like, out of the kind, like, I need to have a car. And now I have more and more German friends who don't actually want to have a car. And it's not because they cannot afford it. It also has to do with a kind of economic wealth. It comes to a time where you have to show that you have money. And the way to show that you have money is you have a car. But, um, well, it's as simple as that. But it also gets to a point that basically I say I don't care and I don't need to basically have a car. I mean, I'm it doesn't make you a better person if you have a bigger car. car. 